I mean, we get up to Saturn mass planets, now we're talking about planets that could start opening gaps in these disks. Okay, but is that the end of the road? Uh, right, because even if in this image you could actually see the planet, you'd never get the resolution to, from the location, figure out whether these ratios uh, put you in a resonance or not. You know, and, you know so if they're not in resonance, we get masses that are too low, they are in resonance can work, um, but it seems like we're in a gem because we can't figure it out. But there actually is a way to break this degeneracy because the system is embedded in a disk and that disk provides dissipation. So what that dissipation does for you is it damps your system to equilibrium configurations in the dynamics. So just in terms of pictures, if I take two planets that are far away from resonances, uh, then the equilibrium configuration is what you naively expect. The disk is just going to damp you onto circular orbits with zero eccentricity. By contrast, if you put your planets at locations where their period ratios are near resonance, then the disk will instead damp you to a non-zero equilibrium eccentricity value, um, where that eccentricity is forced by the resonance. Right? So this sets up a clear prediction. If they're not in resonance, you expect them to be circular. If they're near resonance, you'd expect them to be on eccentric orbits. So it's exciting then when um, a couple weeks after we put our paper up on the archive, the Alma data paper came out, um, and they indeed find that these gaps are eccentric. So I think that's um, really promising evidence that planets are what's responsible for these gaps. It's not slam dunk, I think we're going to have to keep looking, but I think that's going to be a really important constraint for alternate models. Um, if they are giant planets resonantly interacting, there are a couple of um, really interesting implications. Okay, the first is um, that it sets up a puzzle. Uh, and that's a puzzle of formation, right? So if I'm saying that the 4 to 3 resonance is the stable configuration that, that where you can have these massive planets, um, the question is, how, how did you get there, right? Because, um, you know, if this resonance is this, like, cozy shelter over here, this cozy shelter, is surrounded by a ring of fire of instability, right? So how do you slowly migrate against, across this ring of fire to get to this nice cozy shelter? So it seems like the, the only way that you can do this is um, if you actually captured into resonance at lower mass while there's no problem with stability, and then they grow together. Okay, so this is, these are the five planets with distance increasing from the star. Okay, and then we're starting with 10 Earth mass uh, giant planet cores, and then we're growing them, so time is going up this way. We start them not in resonance, then as soon as they get up above a couple Neptune masses, the system destabilizes, but if we just nudge their initial positions within the errors, uh, and you put them in resonance, they can grow to giant planet sized objects. So that idea that um, you could capture early on and grow together in resonance, I think is one that hasn't been uh, explored much or thought about. So that's interesting. Um, the second takeaway that I want you to take from this is um, if these are giant planets resonantly interacting, this is definitely the most closely packed system we know of. Okay? These fractional separation is something that you see in Kepler, but now we're talking about giant planets. We're not talking about super Earths. Um, so, an interesting implication of this is that while these masses are stable for the million year lifetime of this disk, the system is a ticking time bomb. Okay, if you wait for 10 million years or 100 million years, I can guarantee you that these planets would scatter off one another, they'd become eccentric, they'd eject, just like in the movie that you weren't able to see, <laughs> would have shown you. Um, so that's exciting because when we look at the observed exoplanet sample, we see all these eccentric planets, right? Uh, so Eric Ford suggested a long time ago that if systems started in these compact configurations, you could explain what we're seeing uh, in the exoplanet sample, but this would be sort of the first time that we can start observationally connecting the initial conditions following formation to the observed exoplanet sample that we have today. Okay, so the main conclusion is that I think Planets are a promising explanation for what's going on in HL Tau. I think it's important to keep thinking up new ideas. Um, because if they are planets, there are a number of interesting implications. 
uh, check out our paper that came out yesterday. And I just wanted to briefly advertise that uh, Han, Ryan, and I um, just developed a new wisdom Holman integrator that in long-term integrations is many orders of magnitude more accurate than existing codes like Mercury and Swift. And despite being more careful about the errors, um, we've also optimized it so that it's normally one and a half to five times faster than those uh, implementations. So we're really excited about that. I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. So actually, it's the opposite. Um, so what matters for the stability is the fractional separation of the gaps. So right, like these two are 10% different, whether whereas like these, like if this is one, then this is two. So actually, these have basically no effect on the stability, and these three do. So the, the limit of a Saturn mass is for these three. These could potentially be much more massive. Yeah, so uh, it was just a simple thing because we only had access to one cluster. Uh, so we could have put in lots and lots of parameters. Uh, but uh, there's plenty more to explore. Yeah. All right, same here, speaker. 